your source for news, commentary, discussion, and debate at the intersection of the atheist movement and the LGBT rights movement. This is the Atheist Manifesto. From Answer Media, this is the Gaithy's Manifesto. I am your host, Callie Wright, flying solo this week. And this is the part where I should talk crap about Ari, but I'm not going to because I'm a better person than that. That's who I am. So last year, President Obama's Defense Secretary, Ash Carter, announced that the Department of Defense was going to change its policy on trans people serving openly in the military. Uh, The TLDR version of the policy change was that trans people already in the military would be able to start correcting paperwork and accessing medical care on October 1st, 2016, and each branch was supposed to have a plan for recruiting trans folks by July 1st of this year. And uh, there have been some hiccups, I guess, and and it's now expected that the chiefs of each branch of the military are going to ask for a six-month delay in implementing this policy. And all of this kind of got me thinking, you know, for someone who is actually in the military currently what does this all look like and how does this affect the human beings at the center of this i have lots and lots of questions so i turned to my dear friend alice who is currently a member of the military to get her take on all of this and talk about what her experience has been like welcome to the show friend hello how are you i am great so let's talk real quick just When it was initially announced that these restrictions on trans people serving openly were going to be lifted, tell me what your initial thoughts and feelings were. What was that moment like for you? Well, before we get started, I need to put out a disclaimer that anything I say is going to be my opinions and my experience, and I don't speak for the U.S. Navy or the uh, Department of Defense or military in general. So this is all my experience from this. Sure. Um, And to be clear, I had identity issues going back at least till age of seven, but due to life experience and religious upbringing, I didn't really finally accept myself till March of 2015. As of February of 2015, they stated that uh, transgender troops would not be fired, although they were still looking at what needed to happen for open service. So this actually was really great timing for me. It allowed me to explore my gender identity without fear of being fired for it. And then after that, I was able to get the counseling I needed um, for free through military health care. Um, and that, that would have cost you your, your service at that point if you had done that before this policy change, right? Uh, yes and no. There, there actually were people who were transgender serving before February 2015 when they they officially said you wouldn't be fired. Um, But they were few and far between, and it was was a threat to your service. You wouldn't necessarily be fired. So I was able to start getting the counseling I needed, and then they stated that the policy should come out in about six months. Six months turned into a year. Uh, I ended up coming out to my chain of command before the policy changed in June of 2016, just to give them a heads up, like, this is coming down, so you should be aware. Um, And then uh, I watched live the uh, announcement by Ash Carter um, on the Department of Defense website, and I was in tears. It was it was just beautiful. Well, I mean, tell tell me what that means to you to to be able to be uh, to be open about who you are and the people that you serve with. Um, well, to explain a little bit more about that, um, when when the policy did change, I uh, it was June thirtieth, which was the beginning of the July fourth weekend. So July fifth, uh, when we went back to work, first thing I did is I went into my chain of command's office, um, and I was like, hey. I want to change my Facebook Uh, because they had asked me not to tell anyone in the unit until the policy changed. At first, they're like, well, that's privacy concerns. And I said, yes, but it's my privacy. I want to do this. So, well, it's your Facebook. You do what you want. I said, okay. And I came out and everyone was very accepting. Um, I like, I did not expect the level of support I had, but it was just, um, 
it was night and day. I went from not being able to hang out with any of my coworkers, having to hide who I was because I, I didn't want to leave the house presenting mail except when I had to at work. Um, yet I wasn't supposed to let them know. And now I told them and everyone just accepted me. And it was, I, I, I cried tears of happiness as opposed to tears of sadness about my situation at that point. Yeah. And, and I'll be honest, maybe this is, maybe this is a bias of mine that I need to work on, but you know, the stereotype of folks in the military, regardless of the branch is that it's this, uh, this, you know, hyper masculine environment where, you know, everybody's conservative and difference isn't accepted very well and, and that kind of stuff. And so, um, and, and of course there's pockets of that. I mean, cause there's pockets of that everywhere. Um, but, but that, that, that wasn't largely your experience. Uh, I did have problems, don't get me wrong, and I still have coworkers who have conservative Christian upbringing who disagree with my quote unquote lifestyle choices, but um we're protected under equal opportunity now, and they they can't say anything at work without possibly getting in trouble for making a hostile work environment um, and then the leadership were. The older people who've been around for 15, 20 years were the ones that gave me the most pushback overall. And even there, it wasn't universal. I had a lot of support from my higher ups, um, but some pushback that I've had to fight against. It's it's not black and white, and it's not all uh, roses by any stretch, but um, the amount of support I had was like almost as good as I could hope for. Yeah. What, what form did that pushback take? I mean, what, was it them just, you know, saying negative things or um, you know, making paperwork difficult to access or like, what, what did that look like? Uh, more the latter. Uh, they would not say many negative things because that is easy to prove discrimination cases. And since we're protected under equal opportunity, that could get them in trouble. Whereas, um, making sure to uh, be hyper vigilant and checking to make sure I don't have eyeliner on or mascara on the next day or um, making it difficult to get any paperwork pushed forward. That can just be normal administrative issues that, that are easier to hide. And that's one of those where sometimes it could just be that they were trying to it's a new policy. They're trying to mind their P's and Q's and make sure that everything is done properly. Or they could be giving me pushback, and it's hard to prove either way. Yeah, yeah, and I guess it could very easily be both. I'm curious. Uh, another thing that the military is really famous for is bureaucracy. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean... The, the, comparing it to other processes in the military i mean is this thing more more complicated than normal or is it just sort of like another another you know piece in the puzzle like that like how, how does that work extremely more complicated than normal uh the problem is i generally have to educate my chain of command and my medical practitioners on the policy like I've I've read all the policies that I can get a hold of, including the medical ones that aren't put out to, to everyone uh, because I got a hold of them through my doctors. And so since I've read these and I can go to them and say, hey, this is what I need. And there, there are just some unique um, bureaucratic problems with this policy that, that have caused hiccups for, for me and for others. Uh, for instance, I to get any uh, transgender medical treatment, you have to have a medical treatment plan that's been approved by your, your service at some of the higher levels of uh, bureaucracy. Um, and this, for the Navy, it goes to Portsmouth or San Diego, depending on where you are in the world, and has to get approved through them. So you route it through your doctor who has to send it up to big Navy. Well, when I was in the UK, I wasn't seeing a Naval doctor. I was seeing an air force doctor. So I had to help him navigate the Navy bureaucracy. Um, and the new policies, so even though the change came out in June, new policy didn't actually come out until 
October. And as soon as we got the new policy, I, I had my behavioral therapist put up a treatment plan for me. And I got that back in December. Well, in January, I was moving back to the States, so my chain of command wouldn't approve it because I didn't have enough time to actually do any medical treatment before I moved. And I thought that would be the end of, of the problems with that. So I got back to the States, and I'm like, well, I have this approved medical treatment plan, so please let me move forward. And the administration here pointed out that the regulation states that uh, it has to be drafted locally, so you have to get it done all over again. The, and, the, uh, the treatment plan, you mean? Yeah, yes, the treatment plan. And I was, I was pissed, but I went to the regulation, and they were correct. And there, there are actually some reasons for, for that being a good policy. Um, when you transfer from one base to another, you are possibly going into a different deploying status. Now, if I was going to be on a ship without an endocrinologist, it would not be a good idea to start hormones where they can't monitor my uh, hormone levels and other considerations such as that. So um, every time you transfer bases, the local command has to approve your plan. And so, yes, yeah, so I dealt with that bureaucratic issue and I found that out. I, I moved here January 30th and I found that out in early March, I believe. And since then, I've been going back and forth trying to navigate the red tape and I've had issue. The latest issue was I finally got the medical treatment plan all the way up to big Navy again. And they said, yeah, we approved this back in December. Why is it coming back to us? And that, that was literally the time I broke down at work because I, I was at a loss for how to move forward at that point. But luckily I went to my chain of command to some of my allies and they, um, they got further guidance for me, found a roadmap so that we can move forward. And on Thursday, I have an appointment with my doctor to get my treatment plan pushed up to where it needs to go so it can get approved again. So that's the level of bureaucracy we're dealing with. Were there other any sort of roadblocks or hiccups, uh, uh, bureaucratic or otherwise, that you've run into and had to overcome? Uh no major ones. Like I said, I, I've had people um, giving me problems with my paperwork that I thought maybe they weren't being allies or maybe it was just it was so new they wanted to mind their P's and Q's and not mess up themselves. Um, and then, oh, recently, Big Navy told the commands that they were doing it wrong. <laughs> Basically, the the commands when they read the guidance and it said, well, it needs to be approved by a transgender care team. What they meant was Portsmouth or San Diego, as I explained. Well, they figured they need to set up a local transgender care team to approve it locally. And because it's some... supposed to be approved locally. So that... yeah. So, okay. so they, since it's a new policy and everyone's not exactly sure what everything means, they, they did it in a way that, it wasn't meant to be interpreted and that that's kind of part of the thing that caused it to take until June that I'm getting my treatment plan. Um, even though I've been here since January 30th. Wow. And, and so the way that this works, do they just give you a date? Like you're presenting mail at work one day and then the next day you're like using the regs that women use. Like, how does that work? That's mostly correct right there. I, I kind of wish Ari was here for this question. But um, <laughs> the according to the military, there's no gender non-binary and there's no transition process. It's, it's a light switch. You're male one day and female the next or vice versa. And that isn't to say that non-binary people can't be in the military. You can identify as non-binary. 
but for um, cases of how the military deals with you in terms of uniforms, grooming regulations, including cosmetics and hair, um, PT regulations, what PT test standards you have to follow, male or female, uh, all of that is binary, and it has to be either male or female, not both. Now, there are some ways to get around that somewhat, and it's called exceptions to policy. But each service is uh, being a bit hesitant on accepting them, and different services accept them at different rates, and there's different bureaucracies in getting an exception to policy accepted depending on what service you're in. Uh, so it's all very much up to your local command whether or not that will go through. Gotcha. Yeah, and I actually I what well, I didn't think about PT regulations and the like the the fitness requirements and stuff that you have to meet. So that that switches too. Then so like it, you know if the military changes to consider you female, like those those different standards apply to you then. Yes, uh, generally they recommend you're on <coughs> hormones six months to a year minimum, up mm -hmm. to a year and a half before switching your gender marker because um, they want to make sure that the hormones have taken effect uh, enough to make sure that it's not a problem with the new gender. And of course, it's going to be different for male to female and female to male. Mm -hmm. uh, but in my case, since I'm going male to female, uh, it'll be a lot easier on push-ups, sit-ups, and run time um, because that is considered lower in the military for females. However, um, the weight standards and um, BMI standards will be a bit harder to, to pass once I transition. Oh, right. Because your body's built a certain way and, you know, hormones, obviously, you know, they redistribute yeah. fat, but they don't change your bone structure, how tall you are and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Wow. I hadn't thought about that. And, and there are, I mean, there are punishments in the military. Like if you, if you fail those things, um, you know, you, you get put on like a, I forget what they call it. Um, you get put on uh, extra physical fitness. Uh, yeah. It's called uh, fitness. Uh, what's it called? FEP fitness something program. I can't remember right off the top of my head. I apologize. Oh, sure, okay. um, but if you fail two of them within a period of time, I think it's three years, you can actually lose your job. Wow. So I know that, you know, as, as a member of the military, you're not really allowed to criticize your superiors directly and like, you know, call people names out and that kind of stuff. But like just speaking generally, um, do you feel like in general that the the military is accepting this change and is committed to implementing it? Or do you get the sense that there's a fight against it happening at the higher levels? Both. Okay. Um, at the local level, I've dealt with um, mostly support. Like I said, I've, I've had some pushback with paperwork here and there, but I have a lot of allies who are helping me move forward and get uh, the, the paperwork, uh, navigate the bureaucracy, as it were, and move forward. But uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, the military is being rumored that it, they're going to push back the July 2017 allowance of new transgender troops joining uh, by six months. And that Really, that's better than we feared it might be when we heard that Donald Trump won the presidency because he's not been very supportive of, of these policies or in his cabinet. But Mateus has, to his credit, um, he only put out a thing, said, I, I'd like to know if you have any problems with, with this policy but I'm only going to consider them if you can point to how it will affect uh, military readiness. So uh, not that you have a personal problem. You have to show how it's going to cause problems. Um, and then I don't know how much you know about the training that's come out, but all military personnel have had to go through transgender training at least once by this point. 
and sitting in on those trainings is interesting. <laughs> I was going to say, I can only imagine what goes on in those rooms. Holy crap. <laughs> Uh, the worst one I've heard so far personally was someone claiming that someone would transfer or would transition male to female because they failed a PT test and wanted easier PT standards. Well, that was my immediate thought when you mentioned PT. I was just thinking how many people are rolling their eyes saying that people are going to start using this as an excuse to fail PT tests. Oh, that's <sighs> that's a common one. But, but this particular person started talking about Machiave Machiavellian uh, narcissists who would do whatever it takes to, to get what they want. <laughs> so <laughs> wow. it was an interesting, interesting conversation to sit in on. I, I didn't partake in that particular line of discussion. Yeah, I don't, I don't blame you. <laughs> I can just imagine this person like, I'm going to go through miles and miles of paperwork, through layers and layers of bureaucracy, possibly personal and social problems at work and in life, because I don't want to have to run as far. Like, Well, doesn't that just make sense? <laughs> right. I mean, like, let's be real. I imagine there are probably one or two people who would be so ridiculous to go that far, you know, um, because because some people are just assholes, right? Like, that's that's a thing that happens. But like as as a, a thing to call out as a systemic problem, I just people are oh god. It, 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 I even find it uh almost ridiculous that anyone would actually go through transition. Now they may try and claim it to see about getting around things, but when they realize it's gonna take them a year and a half or more plus huge amounts of life changes, I doubt they would go through with it obviously well right because because again like you said you have to be on hormones before the pt requirements change so like you'd be asking someone who is ostensibly a guy and completely identifies with that to say like okay cool we're going to uh take away your ability to reproduce you're gonna grow boobs <laughs> your body hair is gonna thin out like <laughs> oh now, you have to, to laugh fair, if, you, they... if you don't want to cry kind of thing I do think that they do allow for transition without hormones if you identify that way, but okay, that's cool. that's yet that's yet to be really tested very much, right? Because most people who want to transition want to go on hormones, right? Right, that makes sense. Um, well, that's all I've got as far as questions go. Are are there other things about the experience that you'd like to talk about that I missed in the questions that I asked? Anything else that you think is important to talk about? Uh, we went through the major bureaucracy, and that was mm -hmm. troubling. Um, there is actually a support group of transgender people in the military, and there are um, some people at um, high officer levels who've transitioned already. There are people who transitioned before the policy came out, and you even spoke to a couple people who helped set up that, that support group um, mm -hmm. in a previous episode. And it's it's been very helpful. There are resources out there. So if anyone feels that they're alone and doesn't have anyone to talk to, uh, reach out and can get them in touch with Sparta and get them in touch with the people who can show them they don't have to reinvent the wheel in fighting this bureaucracy. There's people who've done it before. <laughs> yeah, and, and Sparta is the, the military organization for, for LGBT folks. Is that right? Yes, it started out as um, all LGBT community. Now it's mainly for transgender um, policy changes. Uh, there are still LGBT communities. They've just been able to be more open since Don't Ask, Don't Tell was overturned. Uh, I got so, you. So Sparta split off and said, we're going to focus on this one issue. Oh, right, because the, the gay thing is not really a thing in the military anymore, aside from, um, you know, whatever personal problems people might have. As far as policy stuff goes, it's not a thing anymore. Exactly. Well, that makes sense. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your experiences. I think this is uh, is informative when we want to know kind of what's going on behind the scenes, because you know, the, the stuff that always gets play in, in the news and stuff is the policy and like what the politicians are saying and doing. And uh, I obviously like to illustrate the human experience and what the... Uh, you know, because policy decisions affect real people. Um, so thanks for coming on the show and sharing your experience. I really appreciate it. Um, actually, I just thought of one more thing yeah. I should mention. Do it up. Um, even though I haven't been able to get hormones started, 
Um, and it's actually really unsure right now how much surger- surgical care will be covered under the military. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, bottom surgery is pretty much decided they're going to cover, but top surgery is kind of iffy, mm-hmm. um, as is laser hair removal and things like that. Um, but I have been able to get extensive uh, behavioral health care. Um, I'm able to go see my doctor and try and move this forward without having to pay for doctors, uh, for seeing a doctor, et cetera. So there are actually really good um, care options within the military. It's just it is slow moving. It's a new policy, and the military is a huge ship, and the larger the ship, the longer it takes to turn. Yeah, I hear that. That makes a lot of sense. Well, thanks again for coming on. Thank you. And that, my friends, is going to do it for this episode of the Gaytheist Manifesto. Again, huge thanks to Alice for coming on and sharing her story with us. You can find the show on Facebook at facebook.com slash Manifesto. You can email us at Manifesto at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at GaytheistCali, and you can find the show on Twitter at TheGaytheists. And let's all have a moment of silence for the lack of an Ari outro. If you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash the Gatheist Manifesto, make a per episode donation to help us out. And if that's not doable, you can still head over to iTunes, give us a five star review that helps us move up in the rankings and get heard by more people. Before we go, I want you to know that if you're lost, you're hurting, you're scared. If you feel like no one cares and no one understands, you need to know there's a community out here that loves you, cares for you, knows that you're capable of amazing things and that you are worthy of love. If you're struggling, please don't be afraid to reach out. Until next time, friends, this is the Gay Peace Manifesto. Manifesto.